hear me without a microphone? Yeah. Anybody can't hear me? <coughs> Even for the sake of one person, I will speak with the microphone, but I actually prefer not to because I don't like to stand behind a podium and I actually like to meet my audience <laughs> uh, more personally. If, if, at, if, if at some point you find like you can't hear me, then just tell me and I'll go behind the mic. Is that all right? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Now, I've been given all these introductions and this lovely young man there with his fantastic opening act. I thought it was great. So he spared I, me I a lot of... I didn't write it though, I didn't write it. It doesn't matter, you presented it. I'm very okay. grateful. I want to very thank good. you. I want to thank the uh, Friends of Palestine, Western Australia, for uh, having me here, for inviting me here, and Katie for hosting me in her house. And uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your own evening to come and hear me speak and to come and attend this event. So I'm really grateful to you. It's a great honor to actually be given a stage to say whatever I need to say, whatever I want to say in front of people. It's an amazing privilege. So I'm grateful to you for allowing me to do that. Before I start, um, I wanted to ask the audience, please come in. It's okay, hi. Um, I want to ask the audience, uh, what would you like to hear when you knew about this event and you saw the flyer, what were you hoping to hear? Just a few, a few hands, if, if anybody's brave enough to, to say. Nobody wants to say. Well, yes? Uh, what for each person may the turn, you know, um, uh, can, can, um, began the process of thinking differently? Okay, good point. Yes? I was hoping, uh, as a Palestinian, I was hoping to understand why uh, uh, Israel, which is the people of Israel, who are very liberal in their views, most of them, uh, keep voting for such conservative governments. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really good so point. It's a really good question, and a lot of my talk will be addressing that and that as well. Though. Yes. So, some way of letting the general public get understand the dissociation between Zionism and Judaism. Okay. And so, so genuinely learn, you know, uh, the, the the true facts of the matter and, and what you know, kind of seeing through the spin that the Zionist state likes to sometimes, you know. Throw Excellent. In the good point. Thank you. Any more? Yes. Uh, yes, I was interested in your military experience and how you felt being at the front line. Uh, okay, that's easy to say because that's a really, it's, it's going to be very quick, the, the answer to your question. Um, yes, Katie? I suppose the contradictions and struggles that you and the people in your book have experienced. Okay, thank you. Any more uh, requests or interests or hopes that you had? Yes, ma'am. Perhaps how widespread, I'm interested to hear how widespread is uh, our people like yourself. Okay. Um, because, you know, we get the sense that so very, there's a lot of Jewish people who would really like to go beyond their tribal loyalties, but it, it is almost impossible. So how wise. I really appreciate that. You see, all these <coughs> questions, all these comments and hopes of what people would like to hear, it's fantastic because it kind of gives me the framework of what I need to talk about. And you're all kind of hitting the point because um, these are the things I am actually going to talk about. I'm probably going to take about, I'll try to stick to about half an hour of your time so we have time for questions. And if people can limit their questions to real questions rather than statements, then it will be more courteous for everybody else and we can have more questions if that's okay. All right, so the book is this book, it's Beyond Tribal Loyalties, and I, um, I will tell you that the way it came to be is that I was pestered by a friend of mine in the United States, uh, Kenneth Ring, who wrote a book called Letters from Palestine. He edited a book called Letters from Palestine, which is a collection of stories of Palestinian people from uh, the United States and from uh, West Bank and Gaza as well. And uh, I recommend this book to you very much. Now, Kenneth uh, contacted me not long after I moved to Scotland in 2010, and he said that he read something that I wrote on my website, and he thought that my story was so amazing because I was born in Israel and I served in the military and all of that, and he thought that it was really worth writing a book about it. And so and he pestered and pestered. Uh, Ken is a very persistent guy. And I started, I tried, but I really didn't feel very comfortable. I, I didn't feel like I could um, actually write a whole book about myself. It just didn't feel right. When I first started my activism back in 2001, I suppose is a pivotal time. It's because I gave up my Israeli citizenship. I renounced it in protest. And after that, I sort of started to become more and more active for Palestinian rights and speaking out a bit more. And um, Back then, I had the impression that I was kind of alone in this, that um, I was also the token 
former Israeli, former soldier that everybody was presenting, particularly in the Canberra groups where I was speaking a lot. I, I lived in Canberra for 11 years. And so I thought I was kind of on my own. Uh, it didn't bother me particularly much, but that's the feeling I had. And uh, by the time, though, I, I came to edit this book, I knew very well that I wasn't alone, that a great deal more Jewish people were speaking out, and to varying degrees and with varying kinds of politics, but definitely speaking out. And um, I thought, well, it, it, because it didn't feel, to, it didn't feel right to, um, to write a whole book about myself, I suddenly got this idea. I was actually on the bus from Inverness to my home, which is about 20 minutes away, and I thought, uh, hang on, what, what if I do what he did? Instead of having a story about me, what if I collect the stories of a whole heap of Jewish activists and put them in a book together? And then I started to think about what was, what was really interesting to me. Now, I don't know if you know, but I'm a psychotherapist in private practice, so I'm not a historian. And although I have uh, an honest degree in politics, I'm not a political scientist or an analyst. What I can bring into the discussion, I think, is a psychological perspective and also insight that comes from having been raised in Israel and uh, served in the army and lived there and speaking the language and being able to read the papers there now. So um, I was interested in the psychological process, I suppose. You can call it psychological, spiritual, intellectual. You can call it whatever you like, but it's fundamentally, I think, a psychological process that Jewish people go through to come from an indoctrination like the one I had of um, being automatically loyal to the state of Israel and never questioning it, and no matter what it does. And moving from that to being a critic of Israel and being supportive of the Palestinian people. And along the way, I've been through the continuum. I mean, I was, I think a few years ago, up until maybe six, seven years ago, I probably was still an apologist for Israel. Deep down, I was still a Zionist without knowing that I was a Zionist. It was so much part of my identity, I didn't even understand what it meant. And, and I'll go into that a little bit in a little bit more detail. So what I wanted to know is, Really, what was special about the people in this book? Why, what was it about them that they were able to do that, whereas the majority of Jews can't do it, and the majority of people can't do it? The book is not just about Israel-Palestine, although that's the context. The book is also about activism in general. Um, it, you know, it's very difficult to stand up for human rights in the world. It's very difficult to stand up for a lot of things. So, One of my heroes at the moment is William Wilberforce. Show of hands who knows the name. Excellent, very educated audience. William Wilberforce uh, was an 18th century uh, British uh, member, member of parliament who basically brought the abolition of slavery. And I'm reading an, a, a biography of his now, and I'm absolutely, you know, I'm thinking he's great. But in the introduction to this biography, the uh, writer writes that William Wilberforce didn't just um, cause the abolition of slavery. He actually caused the abolition of the idea of slavery. He, the idea that slavery is okay, now there is slavery in the world right now and some people who are experts in this area are saying that it's actually growing and it's actually quite scary, but it's actually not okay. So in the Western world at least, nobody would say that it's okay, slavery is okay and should be legalized again. So he really canceled the idea of the abolition of slavery. And you know, when he, he worked for 50 years, he started when he was very young, he started his activism at age 23, 24, and he spent 50 years, his entire career doing this through meetings like this, through meetings in people's kitchens, through flyers, through everything that groups like, like this one is doing. Did he use email? No, he didn't have email. <laughs> he didn't believe in email at the time, or Facebook. Facebook. But you know, he did do that, and it took him 50 years, and luckily he was still alive when slavery was abolished, so he could see the achievement of his lifetime. <clears throat> but it's very inspiring to me. But you know how William Wilberforce was treated when he was first uh, doing that? Vilified. Completely. He was accused that he was wanting to destroy British society, that he didn't understand the complexities of the economy, that he couldn't understand it, and that he, he was told that he, imposing, he was imposing his Christian values on, on the British society and that that was wrong. So uh, I think those of us who are working in this field are actually in, in uh, any kind of activism where there's vilification and, and anger against us, I think we're in good company. He achieved it. The suffragettes, which I, it's a small example I'm also using in my introduction to the book. You know what the suffragettes were called. Even the name suffragettes, anybody who did any study on that at uni knows, this is actually a derogatory term. And there's this wonderful, famous pictures of these women, these long skirts, standing in the streets with, with signs and being taken by police and all that for standing with a sign. So nothing is new, but they achieved uh, the right for women to vote. And of course, women are not yet equal, but 
we're a lot better now uh, than we were back then. So we are in good company. But I still wanted to know, particularly about the Jewish side of things, why is it so difficult to do this? And I think this is where, I think this is where perhaps my little contribution will be to, and has been during this book tour, to the audiences that I've been talking, that I've been talking to, because apparently some of the things I'm saying were new to people, and I hope I won't bore you, um, and that I will, have, I will add something new. So one of the things I want to tell you is, uh, you know, that the state of Israel, people might be puzzled by this zealous, zeal zealousy? No, zealousness, 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 what? Zealotry, sorry, yes. God, brain not working anymore after three and a half weeks of this. People don't understand this incredible fanatical kind of woo about Israel. And, you know, there were three attempts to ban talks that I was giving and... Ignore me. No, it's all right. And you think, what's that about? So I'm here to tell you, as a Jewish person and a person who grew up in Israel, that most Jewish people around the world, and I challenge any Jewish person in the audience to tell me differently, and I will accept that, if that's not your experience, but the majority of Jewish people around the world, in the Western world, are actually not feeling at ease living among non-Jews. Jews around the world are actually quite frightened and quite insecure deep down. Now, on the outside, you won't know that because Jewish people don't tend to talk to the non-Jewish world about this sort of stuff. They talk about, they talk about, they talk about it internally. When I was brought up in Israel, a, a very common discussion that we would have at school, from primary school on, was the question, when do you think the next Holocaust might happen and do you think the next Holocaust is possible? Excuse me for a second. Now, as I was working on the book, I realized that the purpose of having these discussions wasn't to come to any kind of answer. But it was more about keeping that question alive in our heads. When you grow up as a Jew in mainstream Israeli society and in mainstream um, diaspora Jewish communities, you ra you're raised with fear that the world fundamentally cannot be trusted. The, the non-Jewish world cannot be trusted. How many non-Jews are in the audience? Show of hands, please. Non-Jews. Well, that's been my experience in all my talks, um, a vast majority of non-Jewish people. Do you know that all of you have a latent anti-Semite inside? <laughs> yes, often get told that. You know that? You've heard, you've heard that. So this is what I've been told. And you grow up with this anti-Semitism being this bogeyman, this really, really scary monster in the cupboard or something or under the, under the bed. It's not, everything about Jewish, Jewishness and Jewish culture is special. So even the hatred against us is not like any other racism. I think it's just a form of racism, but that's not how I was brought up. It's something that you really, really fear. It's something very scary. And if I could take you inside my soul, you would see what that looks like. I don't feel it very much anymore, but I don't feel it at all anymore. But I remember feeling it. It's very difficult to describe. And so you're, you're raised to believe that the non-Jewish world is actually fundamentally unsafe and that our existence in the non-Jewish world is temporary and that one day it will all be snatched away from us, just like it was back in the Second World War, for example. And um, just like in the Second World War, before it started, when Jewish people were escaping, uh, you know, the... the the Nazi party took, took over in 1933, 1935 come the Nuremberg Laws, basically Hitler makes it basically uh, illegal to be a Jew. Uh, Jewish people lost um, their status as citizens, they lost, lose everything. They have, it's just like they're not, they're not uh, legal anymore. And when Jews began, I did my honours degree, my honours uh, thesis on um, the Australian, uh, the, the Australia, the responses of the Australian press to Kristallnacht. <laughs> And I had the opportunity to look at Hansard records from that time in Australian Parliament. And Australia was very much white Australia policy. Mm -hmm. And these Jews that were coming in, trying to come in from Eastern Europe, mostly from places like Poland, um, were basically seen as primitives so who were going to lower the level of the culture here. And so they were not particularly welcome. And it was very difficult for Jews to find a place to go to. So pe people would knock on the doors of different countries, and it's not that simple. And a lot of the people who who didn't go, ended up perishing in the Holocaust, or who did go to some countries, ended up, well, they had let, some of these countries ended up um, being occupied by Germany anyway, so the Jews got rounded up and taken away. But you know, there's, there's Jews who ended up in China, because it was the only place they could find refuge. There's one woman in the book, Hazel Kahan, who's a fabulous uh, writer, and a great privilege to get to know her. She's from the United States, she's in her 70s now, but you wouldn't know the way she looks. 
but she was born in Pakistan. Now her parents, uh, did you read it? Not this one, but I know about 35, 40 people. Uh, there you go. From, uh, Georgia. So. Uh, to Afghanistan and then to what it, then India, now Pakistan. That's right. Yes, and so, and this is an unusual story. So she uh, was, um, her parents were German doctors, German Jewish doctors, and they didn't know where to go. They were trying to escape, and they were told, you know, they need doctors in Pakistan. So they went to Pakistan. And she was raised there, and, and she tells her story. It's just marvelous. So the history is that um, refugees are not particularly welcome, and we know this to this day. Some of you might be involved also in activism for asylum seekers, I presume, and uh, you know that it's very difficult to get even Australian government to actually extend some kind of humanity towards these asylum seekers and how they're vilified. And I remember in the time when I was doing this activism that um, asylum seekers were called illegals in the papers. Yeah. And they still are, aren't they? Are. And I think it's just disgusting, it's appalling. But um, that if, if you think of Jewish people thinking, I'm gonna be a refugee one day, and this is the attitude of the world, what are the chances of Jewish people going and getting some asylum? If suddenly the tide turns against Jews again, which is what they think is going to happen, I don't believe it, but that's what they believe, it doesn't look good, does it? It's not like the world's repentant, it's a wonderful world and everybody will accept refugees and then we'll just take them and, and love them and care for them. They get put in detention centers and they get, oh, it's terrible. So um, you need to understand against this background that the idea of the Jewish state is actually to be a safe haven for all these people. There's 12 million Jews living outside of Israel and potentially, all of them could become refugees one day. And, and in Jewish psyche, it's not about when the Holocaust, it's not about if the next Holocaust is gonna happen, it's when it's gonna happen. It's a, it's a certainty. Now, don't, don't get hooked up on the word Holocaust and that it has to be identical to the previous Holocaust. What we're talking about is some kind of an attempt at annihilation, at mass annihilation. This is the fear. It's the bogeyman, it's the monster under the bed, it's always there. So Israel was designed from the beginning and still is and it's always been consistent. Anybody who thinks Israel is inconsistent doesn't know this. Israel has always been consistent. It has to remain an exclusively Jewish state. Exclusive because only an exclusively Jewish state that has the law of return, which allows anyone, anyone who's Jewish, whose mother is Jewish, to go into Israel and become a citizen, but this fellow over there, this gentleman in the back who's a Palestinian, cannot do that. He can't go into Israel and become a citizen. So uh, Israel wants to stay exclusively Jewish because that's the charter it's been given. This is the premise that, that it was created on from the beginning, from the beginning of the Zionist movement. If Israel is not exclusively Jewish, and it's just like, country, like, like any country, like Australia or France or Germany or whatever, or the United States, there is no guarantee that Jewish people will be allowed in in, in, such a, in such an easy way. So when you tell a Jewish person that you disagree, which is what I'm saying, I disagree with the creation of an exclusively Jewish state at the expense of another people. What they hear is, I want you dead. Do you understand? Because what you're telling them is that if Israel is not there anymore, because you're criticizing it and it might, um, something might happen to it and it will stop being exclusively Jewish, you're telling them that you want them dead. This is what you're up against. So all these debates in the media and the newspapers, I'm thinking, for goodness sake, that's not the real conversations we're supposed to have. I, I challenge any Jewish person that I meet to tell me that they're afraid. I want to talk about that because that is the real conversation. I want them to say to me what they really think, which they don't say out loud, is that I believe that I and my people have more of a right to survive than other people, than somebody else. In this case, the Palestinians. And by the way, it's the Palestinians, not because the Palestinians have done anything wrong, they just happen to be there. If it was Martians there, it would happen to them as well. My people came in, they needed to create an exclusively Jewish state, there were people living there, you need to move them. That's it, it's as simple as that. So it's basically an exercise in colonialism. The reasons for the colonialism are slightly different to the colonialism that uh, England exercised here in Australia or other, kinds of, other experiences of colonialism, but the evils of colonialism are the same. The same oppression of the people, the same, this, the same dispossession, the same uh, cultural appropriation, the same, all of this, the, the bad things that are happening with coloniz colonization is what you're seeing in Palestine now. Uh, and including vilifying the victim when they try to rise up and resist. You know, I don't know enough about Aboriginal history, but I wonder what they say about what they said back then about Aborigines who resisted. You know? It's, I don't know. I mean, it's not my area, so I don't know. But the point is that it probably wasn't good. 
So you need to understand that. It's really, really important that when you have a conversation with Jewish people that you get that, that they, this is what they're hearing. We're not talking about borders here in 1948 and who agreed to what and partition plans. We're talking about fear. But of course, I, I think, just a second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll just continue and we'll get there. But hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it. So um, now the other side of the equation, and, and I have to qualify what I've just said to you, and that is that I do not give this as an excuse or a justification. And that's very, very important to me that you understand that uh, an explanation is not an excuse or a justification because I do not excuse Israel and I do not justify Israel at all. Now, on the other side of the equation, we've got the non-Jewish world. So the Jewish lobby or the, the Zionist lobby that manages to uh, suppress things that go into the media or don't go into the media or try to cancel events like mine or other people's, they, are, they can't do it alone. You see, the, 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 why is the media in Australia, for example, so, so, so terrified of, of even mentioning the word Palestine or Palestinian? Uh, why are people afraid to talk? Why are people so you know, worried about that, about what, uh, whether they can say this or that or the other? So I, I would like to challenge you and say that I think there's fear on the other side too, on the non-Jewish side, and the fear is of being called anti-Semitic. How many people know that? You know that. Now, uh, I would like to encourage you, I would like, first of all, I'd like to appeal to Jewish people by, by putting this book together and saying, look, it's possible to overcome these fears. It's possible to get through it and to say, you know, yes, I'm afraid, but what does that mean? What do I do with this fear? As a therapist, I have a lot of sympathy for fear. Fear is a human experience. It's not Jewish. It's human. Everybody feels fear. Anybody who hasn't felt fear ever in their life here? See, no show of hands, because we all have. The problem as, that I have is not fear itself, but what we do with it. If my fear tells me that it's okay for me to protect myself and my group, no matter the cost, I think that's where I draw the line. And this is where I started to draw the line, where I began to understand that that's what's actually happened in Palestine, because I didn't know that. When I was growing up, that's not the history I learned. I encountered this history much later in life. I'm, I'm nearly 50, I'm going to be 48 in September, so I'm not proud of how late you know, how late in life it took me to, to realize this. I came to Australia when I was 27 and I think I started to get a brain about, I don't know, four or five years later, gradually. When I first encountered my particular experience of uh, conversion, conversion, I guess, or of starting to move, was when I read Avi Schleim's book, um, The Iron Wall. Somebody might, some people might have heard about it. And Avi Schleim, in the beginning, it does a very devastating, well, it was devastating to me. He, he said, he goes to sort of, he says, okay, here's, here's one of the myths they teach in Israeli schools. Here's the truth. Here's the myth they teach in Israeli school. Here's, here's the truth. And he went one by one. And every time I read them, I recognize all of them. And every, every one I read was like somebody was punching, punching me in the gut. You know, because I realized I was lied to. I realized that everything that I thought was true turned out not to be. And when I faced with that dilemma, I had... I mean, I didn't know what to do, and I felt terrible, and that, that's the psychological process I'm talking about. It was really, really hard, because my, I didn't understand how much my identity was tied up with uh, being part of Israeli culture, with supporting Israel. This is part of the education that you have, is that it's all part and parcel of the same thing. It's expected because it's about our survival, and therefore and Israel is the only safe place for us, therefore it goes without saying that the purpose of every Jewish person is to protect the state of Israel, because that's, that's our safety net, that's our insurance policy against the next attempt at annihilation. So the process that I went through as a result of Avish Lame's book was terrible, it was really, really hard. I had to question my entire identity, I thought I was going crazy actually. And some of the people in the book are talking about the same thing. And it's an interesting, uh, somebody asked what was, or wanted to know what, what kind of thing happened to people. And um, a, a number of people actually encountered some book that they came, like, came across and that caused them to start questioning. So Nicole Ehrlich, who accompanied me on, on some of uh, the tour events, who was in the book, and from, she's from Australia, from Brisbane, but originally from Melbourne, was brought up in a very, very Zionist uh, school. And two of her, I mean, her two brothers are both uh, have both become ultra-Orthodox and have, um, one of them lives in the uh, West Bank in a settlement with his wife and many children and the other one still lives in Melbourne. 
Nicole says that she read uh, Susan Nathan, The Other Side of Israel, which I strongly recommend to you as well. And that's the thing that got her. Uh, and there's a few other. Ritz Ziegel also says he read something and that, that did that to him. So sometimes it's a book. But in, in several cases, it was meeting a Palestinian for the first time as an equal. You see, I didn't even know the word Palestinian until I was 25 and went to university in Israel. Yes, it was Arabs, not Palestinians. We didn't know the word. We didn't speak about the word. Still in Israel, it's a bit... So it was the P word. Oh, yes. So it's not a word you mentioned. And I had a very progressive and uh, um, radical lecturer in the combined program in the social sciences at Bar-Ilan University, and he got kicked out of the university because of his, uh, he was contaminating our innocent minds with ideas. And the word Palestinian was new to me. I didn't know anything. And I knew nothing. Can you imagine? I, I, went, to the, I went to the army. I served in the military during the 1982 invasion of Lebanon. My unit was responsible uh, for arming and um, equipping and training the part of the South Lebanese army that actually committed the Sabra and Shatila massacre. Um. And you know, I only joined the dots recently. And I, and I knew, and I still knew nothing. My boyfriend at the time, who was, um, was not the guy I ended up marrying, but he was an officer in the Ordnance Corps. And so I'm just a young sort of soldier and a young girl, you know, 18, 19. I've got a boyfriend, and he's in the war up in the north. And uh, he gets a pass one day, like a reward, coming home on the, on the weekend in the middle of a war. And you know why? Because he killed, in his, with his tank, five Palestinian people. So he got a reward. And you don't question that. And another good friend of mine was an officer in the Navy. And he was in the belly of a, of a war, a, what do you call it, like a, 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 a ship, you know, a boat. A, what do you call them? Submarine. Sorry? Not a submarine, a boat, you know, a ship. And they were bombing Beirut. From the, from the sea, from the Mediterranean, and killing innocent people, well, bombing buildings, well, bombing civilians. And he, he came, comes home and he said, you know, it's good because I was inside, I couldn't see what I was hurting. You know, and, and I'm hearing this and it doesn't mean anything. Do, do you understand? There's a kind of a, a schizophrenia about this. I don't know that I was happy that people died, but it didn't register. None of it made sense. So there is this kind of, Lack of understanding. You can be right at the heart of it and not know what the hell's going on. It's very strange. And you're blinded by the upbringing that says, we are the Jews who are the persecuted people. We live in a very small and weak country, and we're surrounded by seven enemy states who want to all throw us into the sea. That's, you know, that's great, because you can feel innocent, and you can feel good about yourself, and everybody hates you, and it's a bit of a burden, but you know you're a good person. You know, you're, you're the good guy. You're, you're the good guy. You're the victim, right? Then I read Avi Shleim and I find out that uh, no, we weren't. And it was very, very difficult. Imagine that you um, you love your family and your daughter and your son and your husband and your everybody and your parent and you love them to bits. And then suddenly somebody comes to you and says, you know, they're serial killers. We have evidence. <laughs> Can you imagine what that does to your head? <laughs> I'm trying to paint a picture. So. Uh, it's, it's around this kind of very complicated emotional process, I think, that I was interested in, in, in doing this book and thinking, what, what is it that makes it possible to overcome that? Because my temptation when I read Avishlam was to say, I don't want to know. This is, this is terrible. I, I, and I did. I mean, I, temporarily I thought, oh, maybe he's just an idiot. Maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe he doesn't have good evidence. Uh, maybe he's got an agenda. But you know, he had an Israeli name, Avishlam. I, I know him now personally. Avishlam was uh, is uh, an Israeli, ex-Israeli Jew. He went to London to study when he was 15, and he stayed in London. But he still, he still, still speaks fluent Hebrew, and he has the name, you know. So I was thinking, you know, it, it, you, you have to do all these acrobatics in your head because I wanted to deny it, and I think that that's what we encounter with a lot of Jewish people who are struggling with that and who are trying to deny it as well. So you'll hear all kinds of weird stuff. Like my hosts in Melbourne, bless their heart, while they offer me really um, nice hospitality, they were also uh, Jewish Israeli and I didn't know. And, and they kind of, the wife sort of yelled at me the night before that <coughs> Limud Oz thing, the Limud Oz thing that we were thrown out of. And she said to me, why can't the Palestinians just get on with it like the Aboriginal people? <laughs> Oh, they get all this money. I can't, how many? Philip Roddick said that to me. Just, I was in Parliament House for two and a half days, just, just before coming here. 
Philip Ruddock said that to me. Oh, why can't they get on with it, you know? They've, they've got all this money coming in from Saudi Arabia. Look at them. Look how they live. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, I've heard this before. And he said, really? And I said, yes. And I said, there is an occupation going on. Occupation. You know, and I didn't yell at him. I was polite, but I was very firm. And it seems to me that even at that level of politics, where he should know. And so can you imagine Jewish people who are being told that, hey, the country that you admire so much isn't really a victim country. It's the most powerful country in the Middle East. It's armed to the teeth. It's dangerous. You know, it's very, very difficult to take in. So any of you who are activists who are ever engaging with uh, Jewish people or Zionist people, supporters of Israel, and they don't have to be Jewish. There are lots of uh, pro-Zionist people who aren't even Jewish. I know about Christian Zionists, which is a very interesting uh, thing as well. Uh, any of you who are engaging with that need to be very sophisticated about it. If you just confront people with facts, it's not going to work. So that's the one side. The other side is the fear of your own fear of anti-Semitism, which would stop you from talking. And I'd like to encourage you and strengthen your hands in that because I'm called an anti-Semite as well. And I'm a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors from Romania. My mother was a refugee child who was born as a refugee. And um, I'm called an anti-Semite. So to be honest with you, this is absolutely nonsensical. There are people who try to equate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. It isn't the same thing. Real anti-Semitism does exist, and there are pockets of that you know, in various places. I, I couldn't be bothered with that. As far as I'm concerned, I should all go and get therapy. You know? But criticism of Israel is OK. And also, I want, you to, I want you to know that none of these people in the book, regardless of the fact that they don't all agree with my politics, do agree on one thing, that Israel does not speak for all Jews. And it certainly does not speak for us who are in this book and people like us. So I want to encourage you to not be afraid to speak. Yes.